Jurist Council as uh, Wisdom, which used to be Malfield's gig. But, um, but Malfield's been AWOL for a while, and uh, something happened to him out there in the ether. He's come back with a decidedly different opinion of humanity. Uh, he's now this very evil, you know, kind of dark, uh, icy, remorseless, wraith-like character. And it took all our departments in cinematics to help bring those attributes to life. So a very uh, challenging. Uh, right uh, after that, you know, we start creating the very simple geometry for 3D pre-visualization purpose. As you can see here, it's a very simple geometry. Uh, the, the goal is here is to lots of uh, you know a heart and soul into it. Uh, here's a little test, uh, uh, one of the many tests they have been doing uh, for the make sure uh, you know the Matthew looks not only good on steel, uh, in steel, but also in motion. These little um, tests make sure like fingernails, all these uh, little details. So here's the final model. Uh, you know, Chang and Teal did a great job in terms of putting the details, uh, make sure uh, the character as, uh, as live as possible. Challenge because we wanted to make him interesting, even though he had, you know, a lot of limitations like no face. You know, but the thing is, people are naturally afraid of someone with no face and no emotions. You know, so you just like if someone's staring at you, not saying anything. That's really creepy. Stop doing that. <laughs> very spooky. It just makes you feel very uneasy. So we really wanted to play that up make Malfiel feel very unpredictable. So one minute he's very calm, and the next moment he's explosive. So the costumes also helped us get into character, but they also helped give the actors the same limitations as our CG characters. Uh, we learned that the hood of Malfiel was very important as far as establishing the head direction and communicating through body language. Malfiel also has a very interesting way of getting around. He floats above the ground. And um, to get this look, we really couldn't do it by ourselves. We needed the help of our cloth and simulation team, really. So here's a great example of how animation team and the cloth simulation team work together, integrate our workflow, and make the final character look of Malfiel, you know, all together. Here's the final cloth sim. And a really good simulation on Tyrael, too. Yeah. And the uh, cloth and simulation team, they did something else really great for the animation department on this show. They made us a new tool. In the beginning, beforehand, our characters would look like this, like the white characters with just the bones. Now they look like this, where we have the bones plus real-time feedback with the cloth on the characters in our scenes. Very helpful. Uh, it sped things up. It, we still have to give our assets over to simulation. Like they have to that contraption. When it's first locked into place and... Um uh, secure. Yeah, right. right. Uh, we check this out. The little look of the sigh of relief on Tyrael's face. It's just a very little thing, but it's something to indicate the you know the intense pressure that this guy has been under, and and this weight that's lifted off his shoulders, albeit you know mom momentarily. Um, another little moment is like when Malfiel first slides out of the darkness, right? And he's very still, and we're wondering what's he going to do, building suspense. And all he does at first is just cock his head very slightly to the you know, side. And again, it's just a little bit of business to suggest maybe an aloofness or, you know, just uh, the, maybe even the, the, the icy sort of idol. live action. Um, we get everyone together in a room with props and costumes, and we rehearse all these roles until Mark feels like we're getting somewhere. Mark's right there watching the whole thing and acting himself. This is my favorite part of the whole process. <laughs> Mark likes to make all the costumes, too. Uh, you should have seen the panda costume. <laughs> so we really think with an artistic mindset first. The technical stuff comes later. We really just ask ourselves, how can we make these scenes more convincing? And the trick behind it really is to do this and rehearse enough times that you feel like you're not trying anymore and that you feel like you can kind of let go of how silly you might feel so you can really get into the character. Then what we do is we review all the takes with Mark we together pick out some of the best takes. We think about how we're going to construct these performances with our CG characters, pose by pose and animation. So we look at the really important gestures that are happening in the acting, and we exaggerate those. We push those up. Anything else?
screenshot That's video it. reference of this person here who is Angela. She's our wonderful producer. She helped produce this panel. Thank you, Angela. Yo, Angela. For Thank being you. patient with us. So what Aaron did is he went and he drew dots on her face with a permanent marker, and then he put corresponding dots on the CG character, and then he animated as close as possible to the video. Um, everything that you see here is all keyframe animation. There's no motion capture. He really just wanted to animate and learn and raise his level of observation and try to pick out all these micro movements and micro expressions. So here's the final result of the study. But yeah, it pisses me off, and it's going to make me angry, and I'm not going to deal with it. Camera. She's like that. All you look so happy. <laughs> this is when I just tried on the first helmet camera. This allowed us to see things we've never seen before on the face. It's just something you absolutely cannot see on the tripod. You can see how twitchy the muscles are, and how elastic the face feels. Like you just don't normally see this in, this way. Uh, we went as far as filming the voice of Tyrael, the amazing Jonathan Adams. So we did this. We also really looked at how our wrinkles were working on our characters, too. They, they're very important to the show, because mouthfeel is like the blank, putting it all the Can way through lighting, all together. Run. 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 <sighs> Brother. <sighs> Why? So here we find the model, John, and we did a 3D scan, uh, you know, traditional way. We got the data from the face and body. So, and also that's the important part. We use the Activision's in-house multi-cam system to capture the facial expression of the John, which uh, followed by the facial coding, acting coding system. So uh, one of the technical art director, uh, Bernardo Antonio, so he used his, his tool to transfer the geometry onto John's volume. It's already, uh, you know, with uh, Tyrell's geometry, uh, geometry edge loop, but it's John's volume. This is after cleaning up. So here, we made, uh, uh, establish the connection between John and uh, Tyrell, you know, compressed, uh, condensed uh, facial expression. And, and we set up the neutral uh, on, her, on himself, and then we successfully using the tool to transfer from one to the other. So here's a little video that, you know, test video done by himself. Actually, that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bernardo's face, uh, you know, in the, just for testing purpose, how the system works with uh, one facial uh, structure to the other very different kind of facial structure. Uh, the transfer was very successful. You can see you, you got a lot of that stuff uh, uh, all of the transfer. Alfio needed to steal uh, so souls, and he wasn't quite sure what it was going to look like, but he wanted it something different and new. So I pitched this series of images to Mark. At the time, uh, we didn't really know who Malthio was going to fight, so I used some concept art of the barbarian because the barbarian. Mark had to break well, it to me. Carried away now. Yeah, Mark had to break it to me that I really couldn't have one effect shot be half the cinematic. Shocking. You know, it, it's odd. You know, so we we, saw we, that. Cut it we really knew this is what we wanted, but there was still one question left, and it was kind of a big one, and that's how we're gonna make this. So we kind of started the same way animation does, with reference, you know, but, you know, we, we have a camera too. But at the same time, we take things to a bit more of a technical level in effects. We, we use a lot of highly specialized tools that really track all the data, and it, it, it's really sophisticated technology in a really controlled environment. This looks like science. Yeah, you, you can see some of all this going on right here. We really, you know, got together our teamwork. Um, we worked closely with the effects team. Uh, teamwork is really an important thing at Blizzard. Um, the first thing we did was one of our lead animators, Ricardo, did this test animation 
using the only rig we had at the time which to was match like, more in and integrate with the water effect. It was something great to work with. And once that was kind of squared away, you know, I could focus on my challenge at hand. And that was like, how are we going to change liquids into shapes? And it turns out there's actually some really great techniques for doing just that. And with those, you can do things like this, where you take a cube and you turn it into a bunny rabbit. I mean, because what says evil like a liquid bunny rabbit, you know? Um, but the problem with that is when you take that to an animated character, you get what I call the bubble man. And basically, there's too much liquid to really form all the details, so you, you kind of lose a lot of the fluid nature, but also lose a lot of the original character animation as well. So we, we thought maybe we could just emit a little bit of liquid off of the character. And that actually does something really cool. You start to get some of that fluid nature back in there, but it wasn't the total answer to the problem. So we thought, well, if emitting a little bit worked, why not emit off the entire character? And so the bridge doesn't fill up with liquid. We attract it back to itself, you know, much like we did at the beginning. And that actually does some really cool stuff. And as you start pushing that more and more, you get lots of detail, and you really keep that fluid nature that we were after from the beginning. And it was right around this time that we actually got the finished animation, and so we could really just crank it up to 11. And at this point, we start throwing more particles at it, and there's so many particles, it starts to look like a smooth surface. Uh, there's roughly about 110 million particles at this point, which is 10 times the number of particles we actually use for flooding Thousand Needles in the Cataclysm cinematic. Um, so we might have gone a little overboard, but I think it really helped. Nah. <laughs> um, but if that was enough, we then also add back in that dripping simulation that we were doing at the beginning. And you, know, and you always need more detail, so we add in a foam simulation. And with that foam simulation, you know, it just kind of rides along on top of the other simulation and really accentuates the details in certain areas. But if that's not enough, why not throw even more particles at it? And we do a secondary splash pass. So with this, we, we start getting more particles thrown around, add in more detail. And that brings our particle count to well over 200 million, which is probably one of the highest particle counts we've actually hit on the cinematics team. Um, but we still need to render it at this point. So one of our uh, effects artists, uh, Matt Cordner, generated all these, these passes that you see on screen now. And, uh, these get passed on to the compositor and just allow for a lot of control for them to be able to give that final look that you see on screen. And the compositor for this shot, Jason Hill, then takes all that stuff and puts it together into the final image. And uh, as you can see as we go through this, there's actually a lot of other effects going on in this shot other than just the liquid soul-sucking effect. You know, at the beginning there's the energy shield, there's the death smoke throughout it, and even Malthea's wings at the end, you know, are an effect of themselves. So there's a lot of hard work that so goes into Steven's guys, and they go off and work their magic. Yeah, so um, Dan's team will provide us a bunch of lie rigs, and um, here's an example what uh, Malthea looks like in these different lie rigs. Um, it's a very important process for us because this gives an opportunity to our artists to make sure the materials behave correctly in different lighting scenarios. Um, the the uh, mouth fill was done by uh, surface by um, our... Uh, most of the time you're putting fill lights and rim lights in areas to illuminate characters, but in this case you're allowed to let them fall off into darkness, as you can see in here, and it's much more about just strategically placing lights. And, and you'll kind of notice right here this, this graphic uh, um, shadow across the wall, which is a classic film noir technique, uh, where you see Mickey Rooney, you know, he's, he's definitely scared about something, and it kind of helps build that claustrophobic moment uh, uh, in the shot. And here's kind of another example of uh, some of the composition, how you can see light being thrown in, in different depths to, to create the depth in the shot and the composition. So 